All the world shall worship thee, O God. Sing of thee and praise thy name, O thou most highest. O be joyful in God, all ye lands. Sing praises unto the honor of his name. Make his praise to be glorious. And glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. All the world shall worship thee, O God. Sing of thee and praise thy name, O thou most highest. In honor of his birthday, a litany in the words of Martin Luther King, Jr. <clears throat> Let us, before all else, give thanks for the love of God revealed in the world in the life and death of Jesus Christ. The cross is the eternal expression of the lengths to which God will go in order to restore a broken community. Let us give thanks for the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and for the enduring power of his dream. I have a dream that one day, every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that, one, knowing that we will all be free one day. Let us commit ourselves to pray and work for peace. One day, we must come to see that peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but a means by which we arrive at the goal. How much longer must we play at deadly war games before we hear heed the plaintive pleas of the unnumbered dead and maimed of past wars. Let us commit ourselves to walk in the way of nonviolence. The nonviolent approach first does something to the hearts and souls of those committed to it. It gives them new self-respect. It calls up resources of strength and courage that they did not know they had. Finally, it reaches the opponent and so stirs his conscience that reconciliation becomes reality. Let us commit ourselves to pray and work for a just ordering of the world. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals this is not the time for apathy or complacency. This is the time for vigorous and positive action. Let us commit ourselves to the vision of a world without poverty or disease. I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for the spirits. Let us commit ourselves to seek the spiritual renewal of our nation. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Let us commit ourselves to seek the spiritual renewal of the church. In spite of being disappointed, in spite of being left out without any initial response, millions of people are still knocking on the door of the church and turning to it for the answers to the basic problems of life. The great challenge facing the church today is to keep the bread fresh. And now unto God who is able to keep us from falling and lift us from the dark valley of despair to the mountains of hope, from the midnight of desperation, to the daybreak of joy. To God be power and authority forever and ever. 
Amen. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord, thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that thy people, illumined by thy word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with thee and the Holy Spirit liveth and reigneth, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of the lessons. Our first lesson is from the book of Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again, a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him, 
that I am about to punish his house forever for the inequity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the inequity of Eli's house shall not be expediated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we'll read Psalm 139 in alternating verses. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh Lord, know it altogether. You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the wound. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day, when as yet there was none of them. How deep I find your thoughts, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, that we, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. Today's epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant <clears throat> not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator's sin against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were brought with a price, therefore glor glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael answered him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. I speak and we all hear by the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. You may have read at some point or another among the guidebooks that you've bought to go on trips, the, the Guide Michelin. It's not used as much in the United States, but al almost anywhere you go in Europe, you can find the, the green books that will tell you how to get where you want to go and what places to see. And as the name would suggest, they were produced by the Michelin Company, the makers of tires. Uh, because at some point in their early history, they figured out that it would be good for business if they helped people who had cars and therefore had tires figure out where to go with the cars and the tires and so need to buy more of them. Being French, it didn't take them long before they were figuring out, well, you need to be able to find a good restaurant too wherever you may go. And so over time, the, the guides, which had begun as turn left, turn right, go down this street, look for this landmark, became more and more about restaurants. And at this point, the Guide Michelin is really sort of the, the, the Rolls-Royce guide to where the best restaurants in the world are located. You can have a one, two, or three-star rating from the Guide Michelin, and these are the, the sort of the, the major league of, of restaurants. If you get any sort of designation of that sort, people will go out of their way to come and eat in your restaurant. You'll be rated highly by critics. And, and others will try to emulate whatever your style of cooking is. So not only is it a great honor, and certainly probably good for business, but it's also kind of a burden, because once you got it, you got to keep it. And it's not like because you got it one year, you're necessarily going to hold on to it if you don't keep the quality up. This brings me to an article that was in the New York Times sometime over the holidays, uh, which reminded me of another article from a couple of years ago. So two times when it was reported that a chef and a restaurant had decided to walk away from their Michelin star, or two or three stars. They decided it was too much pressure, or it was narrowing them too much in what they were trying to do. They decided they didn't, they didn't want to have it anymore, and so gave it up. And in the restaurant world, this is a major thing to walk away from something that is the, the, the best endorsement you can possibly get. And in each case, it turned out the, the chef and the, the restaurant staff, the owner, the, the organization, decided they wanted to try something different, try something new. Wouldn't necessarily be the sort of thing that they would get rated for immediately, but they felt as if they were too limited by what they had been trying to keep up with. The time was to go in a new direction. So in other words, to, to follow a new star. That may give you an idea of where all this fits for us in the season of Epiphany. This is the time when a new star shines on us, and when we are called to follow it and perhaps to go in a new direction. This is the time when you and I are called to ask whether what we have been doing, what we have been following, what we have been valuing is still working for us, whether it's still enabling us to be the godly people we want to be, or whether, in fact, it's time to give some of those things up, to turn from them in order to truly follow what it is that God is calling us to do. Now, 
at times it's easy enough to look at what it is that we are putting our energy into, where we're putting our allegiance, so to speak, and recognize it as being evil. I'm not talking about the evil things. You can usually notice when you are, you or we or someone is following something that is objectively wrong. I think the harder thing for us as we go through our lives as faithful people is to notice the things that actually do have some value, that are good, arguably, but may not necessarily be what God intends for us. We get some examples of that in, in the lessons this morning. In the Old Testament, we hear the story of Samuel and Eli. I know I have explained this story before, but it's probably worth reminding ourselves why this is important. The story actually begins before anything we hear about this morning with a woman named Hannah who has had great difficulty becoming pregnant. And she's in the temple praying to God that she might have a child, and she's crying. And Eli, the priest who's in the story this morning, sees her and assumes that she's drunk and goes up and you know, gives her a hard time she says, no, no, I'm here praying that God will answer my prayer and give me a child. And Eli gives her a blessing and says, may it be with you according to God's will. And in fact, she becomes pregnant almost immediately. When she has the child, which is Samuel, she follows the custom of that time, which is to kind of offer that child to God. In later times, you went to the temple, you, you made a donation, an offering, and you took your child away with you. But in the period where Hannah is having Samuel, what you did was you made your child kind of a professional acolyte. He, the first son, went and lived in the temple and helped out as a sort of assistant to the priest. And that's what Samuel is doing with Eli. It's all kind of ironic given that Eli had, had misunderstood Hannah's purpose originally and now the child that comes as a result of his blessing is in the temple with him and ultimately is bringing him really, really bad news that God has looked at the family of Eli and has decided that they're all beyond being saved. So for our purposes and thinking about what might be the turning here, a lot of it, I think, turns on Samuel, who has got to go tell his boss this bad news. I think perhaps Samuel would have felt a certain allegiance to Eli. He's his boss. He's the one who takes care of him, the one who looks out for him, his protector. Why would he want to mess that up? And Eli is, is the, 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 the senior guy in the temple. Why would he want to turn against whatever the temple had told him was the right thing to do and in the right way? Do whatever Eli tells you to do. And perhaps also, in the back of his head somewhere, is the desire to be kind. God has revealed this very negative message. Maybe he'd want to go and deliver it in some sort of softened or candy-coated way. And so it's only because Eli says, no, just tell me exactly what God said, that Samuel is able to turn in this new direction, which is to become prophetic, which is to say, okay, I had something of God's wisdom, God's desire for the world, world, God's will has been revealed to me, and it is my job, my duty to proclaim it, whatever the cost of that may be, personally or professionally or in any other way, this is what I'm supposed to do because this is what God has laid on me. That's his turning toward the new star of his future as a prophet in Israel. Then in the gospel story this morning, we have Nathaniel, who in the other gospels is called Bartholomew because, uh, yeah, Bartholomew, because Nathaniel and Bartholomew sound so similar, I guess. We don't know exactly why they have different names, but apparently it's the same character who has a fairly sarcastic initial reaction to Jesus. Well, who's this guy? Why should I care? He's, he's coming from someplace I don't have any respect for. This isn't where we thought any of that was going to happen. I, I, I've read what it says in the prophets about where God is going to act, and it wasn't over there, it was over here. And so it's only when he's able to let go of some of that, well, this is what I've always done, this is what it means to be faithful, this is what it means to recognize what I think God has always told us God is going to do and follow that sort of charismatic advice that he gets from Philip. Come and see. What a strong bit of advice that is when sometimes all we can do is go and see with the trust that is implied in it, with the 
uh, the willingness to imagine that God is doing something that we've never seen God do before in a person we wouldn't necessarily have expected God to act through. That is Philip, uh, Nathaniel's turning toward this idea that God may act in a way we have never imagined before, compelling us to let go of pieces of what were the foundations of our faith. It's even, in a way, hidden in that strange, that seems like the odd one out, the lesson from St. Paul, talking about fornication. I think what's hidden in there is the desire to have uh, connection, the desire for relationship. Now, obviously, it's not done in a way that is lasting or healthy in the case of fornication. But nonetheless, there's that desire to be in connection with other people. And the idea that we turn from that to live in a more authentic way is a pretty hard star to follow, but is nonetheless a worthy one, I think. So, in all these cases, we're being shown ways that we might turn away from things that we have been valuing, that may even have done some good for us, toward new things, perhaps scary things challenging things, but things that enable us to live in the way that God intends. I could say amen and sit down there and leave you to chew on how you would do that, but I want to give you a couple of ideas that are also hidden in these lessons about how we go about doing that, how it is that perhaps we notice what the new star is, <clears throat> how we discern what it is God calls us to do, and how it is we move into that. I've been using star up until now, which sort of implies looking, and I now have to do a, a hard right turn and suggest that where a lot of this happens is with listening. We hear that in the Old Testament lesson. At first, Samuel is hearing, but not really listening. And it's only when Eli has given him a clue about how to listen that he is able to perceive what it is God intends and then to begin to act on it. There is a, a concept in uh, organizational consulting, organizational design, and, and the health of congregations and other groups called active listening. Do you know this? I'm getting no nods. I'm getting one nod. Okay, maybe one or two. I want to suggest to you that's kind of what Samuel and Eli are working on here and what we need to work on also as Christians as we go through our lives with God and to, as we go through our lives as Christians with one another. And an easy way to remember what active listening ab is about is the acronym BUILD, B-U-I-L-D. The B is for body language. If we're standing like this, the person we're talking to is over here, the person who's talking to us is over here. We're not really showing that we're listening. If we're always standing like this with respect to God, it's pretty clear we're not really interested in what it is God has to say. It's about our body language. Are we open to God? Do we kneel? Do we sit quietly to pray? Or are our lives so busy and so full of movement that we're never really turning toward God and being still long enough to hear what it is that God is saying. The U is for understanding. This is really where the hearing and listening piece comes in. How often have you been in a conversation, and I will confess, this is me, and I will preach to myself, listening to somebody else talk, listening for the things that I thought they were going to say so I can get my points in, how often, on the other hand, do we stop and truly listen? This is what Samuel was failing to do at first. He heard Samuel, Samuel, come here, and he went and did it because he assumed he knew what that meant. It was only once Samuel told him, to, or when Eli told him to listen with understanding and say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, not simply hearing, that he begins to get the message. The I is for don't interrupt. Once again, how often do we, in our prayer life, get partway through our requests to God, assume we've got the answer, and hurry away 
before we've heard the fullness of what it is God intends to say to us. How often do we do that with one another? How often do we want to interject our story into the middle of someone else's story? Remember in the Narnia books, Aslan is always telling people, I only ever tell you your own story. There's a reason for that. It means that your story then plays out uninterrupted by what God may or may not know or do with anyone else in anyone else's life. The L, I'm blanking temporarily on what the L is. I have completely blanked on what the L is. Apparently, I was not listening carefully when I was working on this. The D, we'll go on to D, and perhaps L will occur to me in the course of it. D is don't judge. Once again, how often would we do that when we hear someone else speak? How often do we do that when we hear God speak? Well, that wasn't really the message that I wanted, so I'll take this piece of it, but not that piece of it. How often do we judge when we hear other people's stories? Well, that's a lot like me. That's not like me at all. Once again, Samuel could easily have decided how to edit the story he was going to tell Samuel. Well, this part I think he can deal with. This part maybe he needs to hear later. No, it's about telling the whole story, hearing the whole message. I really need to remember what L is. It'll come back to me. So active listening with one another in our Christian life and particularly in our life with God, I think is an important way of seeing where God is leading us, and perhaps where God is calling us to turn in one direction or another. Then there's Nathaniel and the second piece. What Nathaniel was failing to do, I think, in his interaction with Philip, at least initially, was failing to imagine where there might be something good in what it was Philip was saying, something good in what it was that Jesus might be doing. This is where another concept in organizational development comes in called appreciative inquiry. See any nods for this one? Okay. This is all consultant stuff, I guess, but once you unpack it, it actually has some useful ideas in it. Appreciative inquiry is about how we begin to understand where our, our ideas are and how our ideas may be shared and what is valuable in them. Once again, the way we do this with God and the way we do this with one another. Here, the acronym is, is the five Ds. The first is discover. We listen to one another. We hear what people are saying. We hear what perhaps we didn't really realize was even there before. How often do we go through our lives assuming that we know what other people think? More dangerously, how often do we go through our lives assuming that we know what God thinks without ever bothering to stop and check? <laughs> how often is God slapping the divine forehead wondering when we're going to ask? The second D is define. Once we know what someone else thinks, we can begin to figure out what that means. We don't always pour out our ideas in nice, neat lists and easy-to-follow language. Clearly, that was the case with Samuel and with God. God was speaking, but Samuel wasn't understanding. So it took a while for Samuel to understand that the new definition of the way God was speaking to him was in prophetic terms. This is something that's going on now. God telling someone the way God sees humanity working, you and I wouldn't necessarily expect to get that kind of message. I'm sure Samuel wasn't either. Apparently, Nathaniel wasn't expecting to find that in what Philip was telling him either. We found the Messiah. Oh, really? Well, I didn't expect that. What does this mean? Who is this Messiah? What is this Son of Man? Let's figure out what that means. The third D is dream. We often skip over this part, but it's so important then to allow time and space for ideas and images of God to germinate in our imaginations, in our souls. 
once we know what other people think, once we know what it is that God is pouring out on us, we have to allow it to sink in. And a lot of that happens only over time and only indirectly as we let it work on us as much as we work on it. What if Nathaniel had not been willing to listen to what it was Philip was saying? Well, I, that, that's nonsense. I, I, I've made my decision. I've got to go back to work. You go do what you want to do. What would have been lost? What piece of the kingdom of God would never have been built if he had not been willing to take that step of dreaming about what it was God might be doing? The fourth D is design. Now notice that there are three Ds that all involve just talking and imagining and thinking before we get to anything that sounds like it's even vaguely constructive. This is where the come and see part comes in. Because sooner or later we do have to go and we do have to see. That means different things in different settings. But one way or another, it means eventually having given time for the fullness of God's vision, the fullness of our collective vision as Christians to become apparent, we have to begin to act on it. And then the fifth D, just because it happens to start with a D, is destiny. This is the way we discover what God will make out of what we do, what God will create from what it is that we go and what we see. So, all of this is to say that as a new star rises on us every day of our lives, every minute of our lives, individually and as a community, it is incumbent on us to continue to listen actively, consciously, with open hearts to what it is God is calling us to do. And then it is our job also to begin to dream about what it is God intends to go into see and ultimately to discover the destiny God intends for you and for me. So, dear friends, a new star rises constantly. Let us not fail to see it. Let us not fail to follow where it leads. Amen. Now let us stand and say what we believe in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ Church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. Receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty. 
beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Kevin, our bishop, Howell and Clay and Juan, our priests, and Sheila, our deacon, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, especially Joseph, our president, John, our governor, and the Newark City Council, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that, rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life <clears throat> in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Thomas, and all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Ye who do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and make your humble confession to Almighty God, devoutly kneeling. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us, the burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those 
who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and, and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, because in the mystery of the word made flesh thou hast caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of thy glory in the face of thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, holy, holy. Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father, for that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, Lord, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction and made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Ghost all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are they who are called to the supper of the Lamb. O Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank thee for that thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Will you please be seated? I'm aware of the forecast that there is snow or something in the next hour, so I've been trying to speed things up a little bit, although I got long-winded, and I finally did remember what L is in build. It's look them in the eye. I was doing it at the time with all of you. That's what the L is. So now you're, you have your complete strategy for the week. All right. Let us say prayers for birthdays and for anniversaries. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. First, a prayer for birthdays. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And for anniversaries. Gracious God, Father of all, we give you thanks for another year of life shared in human love and in your love that never fails. Bless these couples in all that is yet to come confirming and strengthening in them the vows they have made to one another in your name. Keep them faithful until they must part in death and bring them together at last in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. There are a couple of important announcements. The first is a simple one to say that we are now three-quarters of our way through our time with the St. John Bible. If you have not seen it, if you'd like to go have a look, if you have a friend you've been meaning to tell about it or a group of people you are, are familiar with outside the church who'd like to come and see it, please let them know. We're down to the last couple of weeks uh, before we need to pack it up and send it back to Minnesota. So if you'd like to have a look, now is the time. Uh, there is certainly plenty of time between now and the end of the month. Uh, the second announcement is to remind you that next week, next Sunday, between services will be the first of the annual meeting pre-meetings. These are to get, to get together to brainstorm about ideas for the future so that at the annual meeting, the, the, the time can be spent more productively than just on an election and a couple of reports. So if you can possibly attend those two meetings, please do so. Sunday, the 21st of January and Sunday, the 25th of February at 9 o'clock in the parish hall. And I believe there is an announcement of more immediate needs. Good morning. I know we're all aware of the cold out there, um, and St. Thomas has been called to host Code Purple tonight. So we have a chance to help our friends who are homeless, um, and we need a little bit of help. We have three shifts available to help to help out. The first is tonight from four to six. I'm sorry, four to eight. And during that time, we'll set up the beds, we'll set up the tables, serve dinner. It's really a great chance to meet meet our friends that don't have houses in town. Um, they're very grateful, they're very, they're, they're just wonderful people and it's a great chance to serve them. The second shift is midnight to 6 a.m. and I know that's a tough shift, that's a tough sell, but it's a great chance to just be with them while they sleep and serve them a warm breakfast. Uh, typically Code Purple wraps up at 6 a.m. but due to the MLK holiday, we are extending the hours until noon when they can go down to Friendship House. We don't want to throw them out on the street in the cold during the day. So we have a second shift, or third shift available, nine to noon. And that's simply sitting with them in the Great Hall. We have some bag lunches to send them out with um, at 12 o'clock. So again, those three opportunities are uh, four to eight tonight, uh, setting up with some others and serving dinner, uh, midnight to 6 a.m., sitting with them while they sleep and serving a warm breakfast, and again, 9 to noon tomorrow, give them a, a lunch and a, and a nice wave. Adios. Thank you so much for your consideration.
This appears to be the week when winter actually begins, dear friends, not just today, but several days this week. There's a prediction for frozen precipitation and very cold temperatures. Yes, ma'am. There is also adult Christian education today. This is the beginning of a four-week series with one interruption for next Sunday when we have the, uh, the pre-meeting. But for the next four Sundays that don't include next Sunday, on the order of St. Benedict and the rule of St. Benedict. If you're interested in what it means to have a rule of life, what it means to live by a plan for the way you're going to live as a Christian, come along and hear what St. Benedict did for his community and how that might work in our lives now. Are there other announcements to be made for the good of the order? If not, then the Lord be with you. Let us pray. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.